this song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Sing it with me if you do. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Lord, our hearts seek you, your kingdom, your righteousness, a righteousness that we could never earn but is, is, is given to us, covered, uh, covers us because of your love for us in Jesus. And so this morning, Lord, as we step into, again, another difficult topic, as we engage your word, Lord, I just pray for wisdom. Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit's presence would be palpable in this place. Lord, help us to know what it means to really lean into truth and grace, recognizing that you are the one who embodies both. It's in the name of Jesus that we, uh, that we pray. Amen. Well, my name is Brian Keepers, and I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity. Um, and we are in the midst of a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7. And if you've been with us over the last several weeks, uh, we, you, you, you know that as we've engaged this together, that, that, that Jesus takes on um, some difficult things that are, that are uh, things that are hard to talk about. And uh, this morning is one of those as well. Um, today we're going to hear Jesus do some of his teaching around the subject of divorce. And divorce, I think, is, is it's a difficult thing to talk about because it's a complex subject. Um, even more, I, I think it's, it's a subject that for many of us touches us at such a, a deep personal level. Uh, maybe you've experienced divorce or you're in the midst of that or you come from a divorced family. Uh, I was 16 years old when my parents divorced. And uh, as, a, as a child of divorced parents, um, I know firsthand the complexity and, and often the pain of that. Um, but I also want to say this, that I know firsthand the grace and the healing that God can bring in the midst of such pain. And uh, God has a way of taking us in our brokenness, and he can, he can make new things. He can do beautiful things. And so today, as we tackle this tough subject, um, I, I just want, I mean, this is hard even when you're just kind of doing this in the form of a sermon too, right? I mean, we're so one way. And I just want, I, my desire is that this would be a safe space for us this morning. Um, that wherever the enemy may want to you know, stir up shame and judgment that the Holy Spirit, yes, the Holy Spirit convicts us, but the, but, but the, the, the Spirit of God would do so in such a way that, that draws us more deeply into God's love and grace and his transformation for us. So hear the word of the Lord then from Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to be reading from the NRSV today. If you have another translation, that's, that's fine. It may sound a little bit different, but again, the heart of it's the same. Chapter 5, verses 31 through 32. Just a couple verses. So Jesus is teaching his disciples uh, on, on the hillside. And he says, It was also said that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, Jesus doesn't say a lot about that. Um, I want to actually turn over then to, to Matthew chapter 19, because there's a part in, in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus addresses this a little bit more fully. And I want you to hear these, these words of Jesus and this, this story alongside um, what we just heard from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So this is chapter 19, beginning at verse 3. Some Pharisees uh, came to Jesus to test him, and they asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? 
So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. They, being the Pharisees, said to him, Well, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate or of dismissal and to divorce her? And Jesus said to them, It was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If, if such is the case of a man with his wife, then it is better not to marry. But Jesus said to them, Not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made uh, eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs themselves for the sake of the kingdom. Let anyone accept this who can. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know what, some of you are just thinking, man, I just wish I could be the one to get to preach this stuff. So, <laughs> John Vonderbrugge, who teaches at Northwestern College, came up to me after the first service, and he said, man, that sermon was all over the place. And he said, but it worked. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to give you a fair warning. This sermon is going to be all over the place, um, but it's intentional, okay? Um, it's going to be a little bit longer, um, you know, just about an hour this morning, so just hang with me. I'm just kidding, not an hour. But um, I want to be as pastoral and nuanced as I can this morning as we step into some of this stuff. So trust me, I'm taking you somewhere, even if you're thinking, where in the world, Brian, are you going with this? Here's where I want to begin. In order for us to understand what Jesus is saying about divorce in the Gospel of Matthew, it's helpful to get some cultural background. Um, here's what we, we need to understand, is that during Jesus' day, there was a vigorous debate between two um, rival rabbinic schools on this issue, there were two kind of key rabbis uh, that schools were formed around. One was the school of Hillel, so Rabbi Hillel, and the other was the school of Shammai, Rabbi Shammai. Now, here's what I want you to know, is that, that, they, uh, that the debate uh, on divorce really centered around Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, right here, and how these two schools of thought interpreted this. Suppose that a man enters into marriage with a woman but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. She then leaves his house and goes off to become another man's wife. Now the debate really centered on the first verse there, and if I could circle that word objectionable, that was the key word. Uh, it can also be translated indecent. And so the question was, um, how, what, what would be an, object, uh, an objectionable thing or an indecent thing that would, would, would provide the grounds for a man to divorce his wife? Here's where these two school of thoughts differed. Rabbi Hillel was much more lax in his interpretation of that key word objectionable or indecent, and he taught that indecency meant basically whatever the man wanted it to mean. So according to Hillel's view, a man was justified divorcing his wife for basically whatever reason, even the most trivial offenses. If she proved to be an incompetent cook and burnt her husband's food, that could be indecent, and he could divorce her. If she failed to satisfy him sexually, that could be indecent, and he could divorce her. If he simply just lost interest in her and went chasing after another woman, that could be seen as indecent, her fault, not his, her fault, and he had grounds to divorce her. You can see, I mean, in the ancient culture in particular, keep in mind that, that men were valued more than women. And women were often seen as property uh, and had, had really no rights of their own. So part of what was so devastating about this, I mean, there's all kinds of things that are wrong with that. Um, but one of the things is that here a woman is powerless. If she's divorced by her husband, she's damaged goods. And in many cases, women were forced into prostitution because they had no other way to survive. So you need to understand that Jesus is always wanting to protect the most vulnerable. 
So that was, that was Hillel's more kind of lax view. But the, the other school of thought was Rabbi Shammai, and, and he was more strict in his interpretation of this word indecent or objectionable. And he narrowed it and defined it in terms of sexual indecency, which was adultery, an extramarital relationship, that that was really the only grounds for, di uh, for divorce. So you have these two views, Hillel, Shammai, where does Jesus stand? That's really the question that the Pharisees are asking in Matthew 19. They come to Jesus. They're always doing this. They're trying to test him. They're trying to throw him off. And they come to him with an agenda, and they want to say, okay, Jesus, where, where do you land on this debate? So they ask this question. Some Pharisees came to him and they, and they, to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Where do you stand, Jesus? Hillel? Shammai. It seems that they stood with Hillel um, and had more of a lax view themselves, the Pharisees, that is. Now, notice how Jesus replies to their question. This is really important. They want to know, what are the grounds for divorce? But Jesus doesn't answer their question. He's always doing this. It's so irritating. They'll, they'll ask a question. He turns it around and asks a question of his own. Haven't you heard? He replied that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become uh, one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. They want to talk about divorce. Look at what Jesus does. He turns the conversation to the subject of marriage. He wants to talk about the way that God designed marriage from the beginning. He refers them back to Genesis. So Genesis chapter 127, uh, it talks about um, the creation of humankind, humankind as male and female. And then he turns them to chapter 22 of Genesis and talks about the institution of marriage by which a man leaves his parents and cleaves to his wife and they become one flesh. So the Pharisees are pre uh, preoccupied with talking about divorce. Jesus refuses to go there and says, in effect, you are asking the wrong question. The question is not, what are the grounds for divorce? But the most important question is, what does God have in mind for marriage? And so I want to take my cue from Jesus this morning. And I'm, I'm not as interested in kind of talking about what are the grounds for divorce today. I will come back to that and say a little something about that at the very end. But I, I think the more important question that I want to put in the space today is, what is God's design for marriage? There's so much that could and should be said about this. Um, there's no way that we can do it in this time together. Uh, I want you to know um, that I'm also just, you know, anytime I'm working on a sermon, I'm thinking about, okay, how's this going to be heard by all different kinds of people? And I'm, I'm re I realize that there's many of us this morning who aren't married. And uh, if you are single, um, I, I want you to stay engaged with me because we're going to come and uh, come to the end and talk about that too. But I really, I really have prepared this sermon for all of us. Three things then that I want to say about God's intent for marriage. Marriage is a total commitment. It's a timeless commitment, and it's a kingdom commitment. A total commitment. A timeless commitment. And a kingdom commitment. This is where I'm going to go off the path for a second now. So before I get to these three main points, this is where, you know, John would say I'm all over the place. Before I get to those three main points and unpack them, I, I do, I, I, I want to be sensitive to the cultural moment in which we live and so much of the controversy and debate around the definition of marriage. And I want to say something, not a lot, I don't want this to be the focus of the sermon today, but I, I think I need to say something about gender and sexuality as we step into this. Uh, over the last decade, cultural views about human sexuality and how to define marriage have significantly shifted. Um, I think among generations, it's shifting. Uh, all 50 states now have legalized same-sex marriage. And, and the reality is, is that this issue has become one that is so divisive among Christians. It can be polarizing among churches. I'm part of a denomination called the Reformed Church in America, where it's right now, there's a lot of tension in my own denomination. So I want to just kind of step into this a little bit this morning about how does the Bible then define marriage? Um, what I want to say is that there are Christians 
who love Jesus and who love the Bible and take the Bible seriously who come down in different places on this. I want to share with you my personal conviction this morning. My conviction, um, which really aligns with the way the church has defined marriage throughout history. I mean, this is really, this has been the unequivocal position of the church for the last 2,000 years, is that, that marriage really, uh, according to Scripture, points to a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. And Jesus, we see there's some significant things that I want you to see that Jesus is doing here in the Gospel of Matthew as, as he talks about marriage. Uh, my understanding of Genesis, and Jesus points us back to Genesis, but I want you to see something. He, he doesn't just go to Genesis 2, which is really kind of the, the institution of marriage text. He goes to Genesis 1 and talks about God's original creative intent for humanity and gender, male and female. That's really, really significant to understand because I, I believe that what Jesus is saying here is he is saying that, that, that God's intent for marriage um, is, is the importance of sexual or gender difference. Uh, that, that marriage is not intended to be a, a genderless institution according to uh, Genesis. Um, the, there's a phrase here that when we talk about God providing Adam with a suitable helper, right? I mean, that's part of the story, is that God par paraded before Adam all these different animals to be a suitable helper, and none of them would suffice. That, that, that phrase, suitable helper, in the Hebrew, the word suitable, expresses both sameness and difference. Sameness and difference. And what God is saying is that I'm providing you a helper who is the same in the sense of who shares your humanity, but who is also different uh, in terms of her sexuality. And that that's important. Those gender differences are important. The word helper comes from the Hebrew word ezer, which is most often used in the Old Testament for God. So it's this idea of representing God. Adam and Eve were intended to represent God to one another. I think the main thing I want to say about that, again, according to Genesis, is that gender difference, sexual difference, is not optional for marriage, but it's part of the essential design for marriage, according to Genesis. Each gender represents God's image in part, but only together do they bring a complementary and more complete representation of God's image and God's covenant love for his people. How we doing? This is a really big conversation. And maybe some of you at this point are like, wait, 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 can we, can we just talk about this? Um, again, I don't want this to be the focus this morning, but I'm sharing with you where my own conviction is. You may see this differently, um, but this is my conviction. And as I've done study over the years, and I've read, uh, I think about everything that I know about on this, I personally have not been able to come to the place where I'm, I'm able to, 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 to really see a convincing case biblically for same-sex marriage. And that's just where I'm at. Um, I just don't see Scripture going there. Now, let me say this. Issues around sexual desire and gender are complex in a fallen world. I have close friends and family who are gay, I love them deeply. Um, I've been a pastor in three congregations, and every church that I've pastored, there have been not just one, but multiple families, individuals and families, uh, who have struggled with same-sex orientation and gender confusion. And I need, I need to say this as a pastor, um, my heart is so much for those of you who are maybe in that place of struggling, because I know how painful and lonely it is. It can be, especially in the church. I mean, the reality is, church, we have not done a good job of being a safe place for people to honestly struggle. Uh, we tend to focus on issues, and we want to debate the issues. Uh, we, want to, we want to make this about problems to be fixed, and, we, and we, we fail to really see that we're talking about real people. And so even as we tackle this, whether it's human sexuality or the, the topic of divorce, I'm going to keep bringing us back to this place of saying we're talking about real people. And Jesus loves real people. The church is called to love all people. Um, I, I, I want Trinity to be a place where anybody and everybody is welcome to be a part of this church. Every person, no matter what their sexual orientation or gender identification, bears God's image. 
and deserve to be treated with kindness and respect and dignity. Let me also say this. Every single one of us, no matter what our sexual orientation or gender may be, are broken and in need of healing and redemption. As a heterosexual married man, I recognize that my own sexuality and gender is broken and tainted by sin and needs to be transformed. And so I think as we address some of these issues of sexuality, we got to resist just talking about things like gay marriage, same-sex marriage, that there's, there's a, a lot of other things around this topic of sexuality that are really important. And we need to look in the mirror at ourselves before we judge anybody else. I'll never forget the conversation I had with a man in my first congregation, I'm going to call him Bill, uh, who right around the time that Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, he said to me, he says, if our church ever supports that, I'm leaving. And the irony for me with this was that Bill was divorced, he was living with his girlfriend and was act, uh, sexually active, and he and his wife had both been in extramarital affairs. And yet, his focus was on those people. Jesus will say later in, the Mount, uh, later in the Sermon on the Mount, why do you point out the speck in your neighbor's eye when you have the log in your own eye? And the measure by which you judge others, you will also be judged. Church, we need to be compassionate about this. Grace and truth together. Let me move back on path. Let's talk then, just briefly, about these three things then that I mentioned in terms of God's design for marriage. Um, these three things of God's intent for marriage is that it would be a total commitment, that it would be a timeless commitment, and that it would be a kingdom commitment. Just briefly, let me unpack these this morning. Um, first, total commitment. When we say... I do, it is an all-comprehensive statement. In effect, we are vowing to each other when we make promises to our spouse. We are saying, I promise my whole self to you, all that I am or shall be is now bound to you. I mean, Jesus says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one. I mean, this is a total commitment of giving our whole self. It, it, it includes both the best parts of who we are and also the worst parts, our weaknesses and our strengths. I mean, both people who come into a marriage bring blessings and baggage, beauty and brokenness, good and bad, and, and we don't get to pick which parts we want, right? We get the whole mix. I'll often say to my wife, Tammy, I'm all yours, babe. All of it. I remember she, I remember she said to me, she said, you know, Brian, before we got married, I thought you were perfect. <laughs> And I, I was, you know, it didn't take long for me to kind of free her of that illusion. I had a mentor, his name's Wes. Uh, he and his wife, Nell, she just passed away two months ago. He used to pastor over in Sioux Center. And one of my favorite stories is somebody in that church came up to, to Nell and said to her, what's it like to be married to a man of God? You know, it's like, wow, it just must be amazing. And she said, yeah, he's a good man, a kind man. Uh, he gets on my nerves at times. He can be irritating. He passes gas, and he picks his nose. <laughs> Just kind of like any man. Someone has said that if love isn't blind, it does at least squint a bit. Um, it's, it's natural that we enter into marriage with idealistic expectations. When I do pre-marriage counseling, every couple I work with um, scores high on the inventory around idealistic expectations. And maybe there's part, like, like, maybe there's a gift in that, because if any of us really knew what we were getting into, would we do it? <laughs> you know, maybe that there's a sense of naivete that comes as a gift. But at some point, if our marriage is really to become what God intends it to be, we've got to get beyond the idealization and learn what it means to embrace the reality of who each other is. This total commitment. I love the way that Dan Allender puts this. He says, marriage requires a radical commitment to love our spouses as they are while longing for them to become what they are not yet. I love that statement. To love them as they are while longing for them to become what they are not yet. Every marriage moves either toward enhancing one another's glory or toward degrading one another. 
Every marriage moves towards enhancing one another's glory, helping each other become who God intends us to be, or degrading one another. It's a total commitment. It's the way that God loves us, right? Embracing us, accepting us as we are, not as we should be, and yet longing for us to become all that God desires us to be. Here's the second thing. It's a total commitment. The second thing that God's intent for marriage is that it's a timeless commitment. Uh, God's plan for marriage is that it would be permanent, a lifelong commitment that promises are made to each other without conditions. So here's the truth. And some of you in the, in the room this morning, you know this even better than me because of the, the amount of life that you've lived, but the reality is, is that things will change with time. You are going to change, your spouse will change, your relationship will change, and when we stand up at the altar and we say, I do, standing there hand in hand, we are ignorantly peering out into the darkness, having no idea exactly what the future will hold. There will be good things, hopefully, lots of good things, moments of joy, but the reality is, is that there is going to be pain, there is going to be hardship, there is going to be struggle, there are things that we will face that are unforeseen, that we maybe have no idea. And when we say, until death parts us, we are declaring that even though I have no idea what the future holds, and that things will change over time, my commitment to you will not. I'm binding myself to you, no matter what the future brings. That's what God intends, that kind of uh, timeless commitment. Again, this is the way that God loves us without conditions. I'm with you to the end. So Jesus upholds marriage as something to be taken very seriously, a total commitment, a timeless commitment. But all of this, and here's maybe one of the most important things I want to say this morning, but all of this points to the reality of God's covenant relationship with us. This is what marriage is for. Thirdly, marriage is intended to be a kingdom commitment. And if we only get to the part of talking about total commitment and timeless commitment, but don't go to this third part, we, we, we have a myopic view of marriage. We're not understanding really what God intends for it. God intends for marriage to be for more than just two people. That may sound kind of risque, like, what? What do you mean by that, Brian? Well, here's what I mean by that. It's, it's about more than just a couple. And if you're only focused on yourself, if you're only focused on your life together, your joy, your happiness, you are missing the larger purpose for marriage. And that is that God gives us the, the, the institution of marriage, the covenant of marriage, to be a visible sign of his kingdom. That our marriage is always intended to point beyond ourselves to God's kingdom. Um, that, that we're called to be on mission with God. That our, our, our marriages should be missional if they're living into God's design. Every time the New Testament talks about marriage, it talks about it beyond just the, the, the couple themselves, but talks about how this becomes now the analogy for Christ's relationship to the church. So here's the most famous place that Paul talks about this is Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word so as to present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. For this reason, so he's Genesis, right? This is back to Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, says Paul, but he's not necessarily talking about the marriage between a, a, a man and a woman, but he's, he's saying this is a great mystery as it applies to Christ and the church. Marriage always points to Christ's faithfulness to us as his bride. God intends for marriage then to be a, a sacred relationship in which God uses our marriage to train our hearts to seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. In other words, marriage is intended to also be a spiritual discipline to help us grow in Christ-likeness. The two hardest things that I've ever done in my life are marriage and parenting, and I kind of feel like I suck at both. You know, I don't know if anybody, else, or stink, sorry. I, I, but that's just true. I, I mean, it's, it's a mess for me a lot of the time. And there's nothing like marriage that has held up a magnifying glass to my own brokenness 
in my selfishness. You, you know what I'm saying? But there's also nothing like marriage that God has used to show me grace and to begin to really shape me and form me more and more into the image of Jesus. What if you thought about your marriage uh, as Gary Thomas says it? Some of you are taking this class, by the way, sacred marriage. Gary Thomas says, what if you thought about marriage as not about primarily making you happy, but to make you holy, to make you more like Jesus? Embrace your marriage as a spiritual discipline. And of course, as we learn to do that, we find ourselves then seeing that our marriages are about joining God in his mission. How are you and your spouse joining God in mission together? Do you see your marriage as being about being on mission with God? I'll never forget the couple in my previous church who on their 60th anniversary, they came up to me and they, and they, they, they wanted to show me what they had inscribed on their wedding rings. And so it took them about five minutes to try to twist their wedding rings off their fingers. But when they got it off, they pointed to, in the inside, um, it was etched in there, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. And they said that verse was what was preached at our wedding. And for the last 60 years, we've sought to let that verse shape the way that we live our life together. Seeking first the kingdom of God. That's a vision for marriage that is bigger than just two. Well, as I kind of bring this to a close this morning, uh, let me just say a couple other things. Thanks for hanging with me. It's true that marriage is a gift, and it's a gift that's, that's given to the church primarily to point to Christ's covenant relationship with us. And I think we need, to, we need to embrace marriage as the sacred gift that it is, but we need to be careful that we're not turning marriage into an idol. And I think this happens. I think too often in the church, we elevate it. Um, the truth is, is that we need to find a way to embrace singleness as a gift, too, because married people and single people need one another. Our church community needs both. We each bring gifts to one another. And, and I think that we've we got to be careful not to look at marriage. I think too often we can think of marriage as, as this is something that I'm not fully human until I'm, until I'm married, that if I'm a single person that somehow maybe I'm, a, I'm less than human or if I'm divorced, somehow I'm less than human. Do any of you, some of you are, are too young for this, but do you, does anybody remember the, the movie Jerry Maguire? Have, you, have any of you seen that? Have any of you college students seen it? Tom Cruise, Renee Zellweger. Um, well, you know, so it's, there, there's this scene in this movie and it's kind of the, the romantic moment in the movie where after the strain in their relationship, you know, uh, um, uh, Tom says to Renee, I can't remember their character names, but he says to her, he says, he says, you complete me. And you can just hear the collective sigh in the theater. We, you know, every heart melts. That's just so beautiful. You complete me. And it's baloney. <laughs> I wanted to use another word. No human being completes you. This is part of the problem with the way that we look at marriage right now and romantic relationships. I want you to hear this. Jesus says that he alone is the one who completes us. And if being married is what it means to be fully human, then what does that make Jesus, who was single? I mean, Jesus shows us what it means to be fully human. There is no other person who will complete you. And even in your marriages, if you're looking to your spouse to complete you in only the way Christ can, your marriage will never be what it could otherwise be. I also want to say this about that. If it's true that then that, that ultimately I think we need to realize that our identity, our truest identity, whether you're married or single, whether you are heterosexual or somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction, ultimately, all of our identity is in Christ. And I think we need to keep coming back to that. Jesus, who he is, what he's done on the cross is what defines us. It's, it's what makes us children of God. It's how God continues to work in our lives to transform us. And it's also true that we all have a need for connection and community. What's fascinating is that in the Old Testament, God solves the problem of man being alone by giving the institution of marriage. In the New Testament, we see a shift that no longer do, do, new, do the New Testament writers put the emphasis on marriage in terms of dealing with our need for connection, but, starts, but, but the New Testament shifts to say that our, our ultimately our desire for connection and community is found in the church, in the body of Christ. 
And it makes me wonder, for both marrieds and singles, what if we really could be the church together in a way that we could really come alongside each other and, and be in community with one another and practice a kind of authenticity where we didn't have to hide from each other, where we could embrace one another as we are and help each other become all that God desires us to be. I think that that's the vision of what God intends for the church. You know, as I draw this to a close this morning, the question remains, what about those times when divorce does happen? Are there times when divorce may even be necessary or the best option when there are not a lot of good options? And the answer to that is yes. Sometimes in a fallen world, divorce, though certainly not what God intends, is necessary for the preservation of life. Sometimes it is the best option of not a lot of good options. And if we find ourselves having to make that decision, then we rest in God's grace, that his grace is bigger than all of our sin, and take responsibility for the part that we've played in the brokenness. You know, for those of you who are married today, I want to encourage you to continue to embrace marriage as a gift from God, and in Christ's strength to continue to work at it. It's hard. Don't give up. Get community around you. For those of us who are divorced, I want you to hear this. I want you to know that you are no less loved by God, that you are no less valued, that you are no less in the kingdom of God. I would encourage you to take responsibility for the part that you've played in the marital breakdown, to receive God's forgiveness and healing, to learn what you can from your brokenness. But the good news is that by God's grace, there is life after divorce. I've experienced that. My family has experienced that. And for all of us to know that God's grace in Jesus is what completes every single one of us today, single, married, or divorced, we can only go forth by grace alone, a grace that is greater than all of our sin, a grace that picks us up, a grace that strengthens us, a grace that is sufficient. It's sufficient in every moment. A grace that reminds us that in the end, it's not about our faithfulness, but that we have a God who is faithful to us even when we're not. A God who makes promises to us, to you, to me, to take us as his beloved in good times and bad, in sickness and in health, his promise to never leave us or forsake us, his promise that because of his fierce, passionate love for us in Christ, not even death can do us part. Amen? Oh, Lord, your love and your faithfulness is so great. And this morning, as maybe there's different things that are getting stirred up for each of us as we step into some hard things. Lord, I pray that we would just be responsive to how your spirit is moving in our own hearts today. Lord, I pray for all of us that we would find our ultimate sense of identity and significance and value in you and in you alone. Whether we're married, single, divorced, whatever our sexual orientation or what's going on inside of us, that we would ultimately find our identity in you. you would take us as we are and that by your grace you would help us become everything you desire us to be for great is your faithfulness